Hello everyone, welcome back. Chapter 6 deals with an introduction to some of our non-living agents. Uh, we will focus primarily in Chapter 6 on the viruses, uh, but we'll also talk about the two other significant members of this uh, grouping, the viroids and the prions, which we've mentioned briefly in our first few chapters of the course together. Uh, but the uh, greatest emphasis for this chapter is going to be placed on the viruses. So let's jump right into it. Um, viruses have a rather short history compared to the bacteria. Um, Louis Pasteur was really the first one who documented any type of possibility that an infectious agent other than a bacteria could exist. Um, and this was particularly around the rabies virus, which was first into the discussion loop around the year 1884. We also had two important scientists that worked with a, a particular virus known as the tobacco mosaic virus, and their names were Ivanovsky and Bejerink. And they were the ones who were able to show that a virus could actually cause a disease in a plant. Uh, such as tobacco crops. And again, we mentioned that was called the tobacco mosaic virus. And then 1950s was really where this became kind of its own field of uh, microbiology, which was termed virology. At this point, they really did not call it microbiology. Um, if you took a course back in the 50s or the, even the 40s, um, it would have been referred to as either bacteriology or virology depending on what particular uh, element of microorganisms you were studying. And in the 50s, this is where we first came with our, our general common consensus for a definition about what a virus contained in terms of its structural elements. And again, we mentioned that these are metabolically inert, so they're non-cellular or acellular. So these are not living things. And these particles, as they're often described, since they're not considered organisms, have a few things. They have a definite size, and we'll see that they are ultramicroscopic. They are much smaller than the, tit, uh, the typical eukaryotic or prokaryotic cells that we have discussed. They have a shape, and they also have a particular chemical composition that defines their outer structure, as well as the nucleic acids that they carry within their um, shell. So we know already that viruses are kind of really the newest form of microorganisms, and they are actually considered the most abundant of all microbes on Earth, and that they had a feature in, in determining the evolution of bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, as these different domains have been infected with different host ranges for the, uh, the viruses. These organisms have had to continue to adapt and evolve over time uh, to survive uh, these infectious agents. And we've already mentioned that they are obligate intracellular parasites, so they require a host cell for all of their metabolic and reproductive capabilities. They can't do them uh, outside of a host cell. They are completely inert and uh, non-functioning. So the general size of viruses, as we mentioned, they're ultramicroscopic. Most of them are less than about 2 microm 0.2 micrometers in size, meaning that they are actually, uh, in order to visualize them, we need to utilize the electron microscope. You cannot view um, viruses with a light microscope. And I really like this particular picture it's from your text. And it details out, so if we take something like uh, an E. coli, which is about two micrometers long, a streptococcus, which is a common skin organism, which is about one micrometer long, and then you start to get into the viruses. And if you take a look, we start 800 nanometers. So these are all tiny. These are, when we talk about nano, I mean, this is, you know, you're talking nine zeros um, in when you spell the whole thing out. So it's an extremely small measurement. 
Um, you know, we go all the way down from something like a megavirus down all the way down here to something like a hemoglobin molecule, which carries uh, oxygen in your blood. So these are incredibly tiny and can only be visualized using the electron microscope. The largest viruses average about between 500 and 1,000 nanometers. And um, we talk about things like the megaviruses and the pandaviruses, which are are much larger in size than some of the typical viruses that we know of. So really important, and for us to kind of understand as we go and we continue to build in this chapter, viruses do not have a resemblance to cells. There's no nucleus, there are no organelles, there's no uh, truly defined cell membrane. They do not have ribosomes, so they are not able to synthesize their own proteins. Again, that's that obligate intracellular parasite. They contain only the parts needed to be able to attach and invade a host cell. So they often have um, molecules, which we'll talk about, things like tail fibers and spikes on their outer surface that will allow them to attach to receptors on host cell membranes. Now, when we talk about a virus particle, and I like this particular figure on the right here, I think it does a great job at describing this. If we're talking about a single viral particle, it has two parts. It has a covering, and this covering or shell is known as the capsid. The capsid is actually formed of subunits, which are known as capsomers. These are protein coats that surround the uh, internal contents of the virus. All viruses have a capsid. No matter what virus you're talking about, whether it's an animal virus or a bacterial virus, they all have a capsid or protein coat. Envelopes, on the other hand, is an additional layer that surrounds the outside of the capsid. And the envelope is only found in animal viruses. So that's an additional layer that that particular uh, viral group carries. Now, inside the capsid or inside the protein coat in the core of the virus, this is where we find the nucleic acid. And it's important to note that viruses have either DNA or RNA, never both. So you're either a DNA virus or you're an RNA virus. They also do have some enzymes uh, that are able to help with some particular functions of entry, but they're again not found in all of the viruses. Viruses have a what they call a crystalline nature, and that means that their molecular structure consists of these repeating molecule units that give them this kind of crystal shape to them. If you take a look at uh, this particular picture here from under the electron microscope, uh, even this one here, they have this really regular repeating pattern of structure to them. So we already mentioned that all viruses have that capsid or protein coat that surrounds and protects the nucleic acid. So this little blue diamond that you see here, this is the capsid, and these individual little triangles that you see that make up the capsid are known as the capsomers, and it's a protein molecule. And you'll notice that in the core, we have this helical wound purple uh, line here. This is the nucleic acid. This is the DNA or the RNA. This particular viral particle that you see here, this is what would be known as a naked or non-envelope virus. So I mentioned to you earlier that the animal viruses contain an additional layer on the outside of the capsid known as the envelope. Since this virus does not have an envelope, this would be called a naked or non-envelope virus. Viruses have different shapes to their capsids, different structural shapes to the capsids. For instance, they could be helical, so they can have this kind of uh, tubular-shaped structure, cylindrical-shaped structure to them. 
Or they can be icosahedral, which means that they have this three-dimensional shape that's 20-sided uh, and has 12 very evenly spaced corners to them. You will notice, kind of going back to our last slide, this particular picture down here, we still have our capsid, this diamond-shaped protein coat with our nucleic acid in the core. But we also have, you'll notice, this additional layer that surrounds the capsid, which is known as the envelope. And that envelope has these little studs or spikes on its surface that help for attachment to host cell membrane. So when we talk about a helical capsid, remember that this is cylindrical in shape. So here is our cylindrical capsid here, which is comprised of our individual subunits or capsomers. They assemble into these hollow disks and the nucleic acid is basically fed through here. Think of this as kind of like an outer sheath on an electrical cord. So you have that, that black rubber uh, cord that you would see when you would plug something in and then the copper wire that actually conducts the electricity is run through the center of that cord. So this this uh, nucleic acid is actually um, run through the center and then they elongate this capsid in both directions. So it would go to the left and they would also elong, uh, elongate it to the right as well. Here's our icosahedral, which is that 20-sided, uh, regularly repeating pattern with the 12 evenly spaced corners. Uh, so I did want to point that one out to you as well. And we've also mentioned the envelope, and this is kind of a cross section. So you'll notice here's our outer envelope with our capsid, which is represented as the brown layer on the inside. And then in the very center is our nucleic acid core. The envelope, this outer layer, is actually a piece of host cell membrane. So when this particular animal virus exits the host cell, it actually pinches off a piece of the host cell membrane that will surround the virus. Now this presents some challenges, especially for the immune system. If the, immune, if the virus is surrounded with a piece of host cell membrane, uh, the immune system of your body is targeted as a hallmark to not recognize self. So self does not recognize self. So your immune system is not going to attack these viral particles. Since it's surrounded with your host cell membrane, it is not able to um, target it because it just sees itself as a regular piece of your uh, your tissue or your body. The Again, these spikes that we see on the outside, these are essential for attachment of the virus to the outside of the host cell. And when we talk about functions of the capsid and, and or the envelope together, Really what it does is it's designed to protect the core. It's designed to protect the nucleic acid, the DNA or the RNA that is in the center of the virus. And as we mentioned, it also helps this virus to be able to bond to or bind with the outside receptors on a host cell membrane to be able to penetrate and get its uh, DNA or RNA inside the host cell. So really what it's all this viral uh, covering or capsid or envelope we're trying to do is protect this nucleic acid long enough to get it inside the host cell. So we've mentioned so far when we get into and we talk about the three basic groups of viruses, we've talked about the non-enveloped, which contain just the protein capsid and the nucleic acid core. We've talked about the enveloped viruses, which contain the additional uh, envelope, which is pinched off from the host cell membrane. And we have one additional type, which are known as the complex viruses. And these are very atypical in that they don't have a particularly universal shape to them. So for instance, the pox viruses, which cause a series of diseases like smallpox and cowpox, 
typically lack a capsid and are covered by this kind of dense layer of lipoproteins, which are a hybrid between uh, a lipid and protein uh, structure. The one that we're going to talk about is this spidery looking creature down here, which is known as a bacteriophage. So, really important takeaway for our class together is that viruses can affect every single form of life, including plants, including animals, even bacteria have a subset of viruses that can infect them. And we call this subset of viruses that infect bacteria a bacteriophage. So you'll notice that we have this uh, capsid at the top with our nucleic acid in the core. But then it also has kind of this neck region and body. And at the bottom, it has these little things that look like legs. These are known as tail fibers. And these tail fibers work almost like spikes. Their job is to attach to the host cell. And you'll notice that at the bottom of the sheath region here, we have these little spikes. Uh, they call those tail pins. And those tail pins are responsible for punching a hole in the host cell membrane to be able to get the virus inside of the host cell. So you'll, we'll see in a few that this uh, bacteriophage literally contracts and it injects this nucleic acid down the sheath and inside of the host cell. And the, uh, all of these structural components of the virus actually stay on the outside of the membrane. So again, here's our three groups. We've got the non-enveloped, which we said could be helical or icosahedral in shape. We have our enveloped viruses, again, helical that kind of cylindrical shape or icosahedral, having that extra envelope. And then we have the complex, which have this atypical shape to them. We also mentioned that in the core, we find the nucleic acid. And the viral genome can either be DNA or RNA, but never both. And the nucleic acid is designed to carry the individual genes that are essential to helping the virus to invade the host cell. And once the virus invades the host cell, it basically hijacks the cell. It takes it over and now has the cell reproducing and replicating all of its parts to make more viral particles. So there's not a great deal of complexity to the nucleic acid. Uh, usually just about a few to uh, maybe up to in the hundreds, low hundreds of genes um, for each viral uh, genome. The nucleic acids, as we mentioned, can either be DNA or RNA. And when we talk about DNA viruses, they are usually double-stranded, meaning that there's two strands that are uh, woven together to form this helical shape. But we do have some viruses that can be single-stranded, so there are a few um, additions to the rule. And the DNA viruses can either be circular or linear in shape, either straight or circular. RNA viruses, on the other hand, opposite of the DNA, they are usually single-stranded. However, there are some uh, alternatives to the rule, and there may be some double-stranded RNA viruses. When we talk about the general structure of viruses, there are some other enzymes that we've talked about that are present for some of the viruses. And these enzymes are typically responsible for assisting with viral replication, making new viral components. These include enzymes like a polymerase enzyme, which is designed to help synthesize DNA or RNA to make new nucleic acids. We have the replicase which is an enzyme that's responsible for helping RNA viruses to copy their RNA, which is important for replication. And we will see something like the HIV virus and uh, other types of viruses have an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, 
And typically, when we talk about nucleic acids, we go from DNA to RNA to protein. However, these uh, what we call retroviruses actually go backwards. They can take RNA and they can turn it back to DNA. And in order for them to go from RNA back to DNA, they need this enzyme called reverse transcriptase to be able to do so. So we've already talked about in our first few chapters together, we've done a brief overview of how viruses are classified, but I do wanna run through it again. So there are some key uh, targets. First of all, structure. So are they uh, DNA or RNA viruses? Their chemical composition? And then also their genetic makeup. And specifically, again, we've mentioned DNA or RNA, but also the number of nucleic acid strands that are present. So we can look at things like the type of capsid, we can look at the nucleic acid, and in terms of structure, we can also see, are they enveloped? Are they non-enveloped? Are they complex? To date, the International Committee on Taxonomy, which is responsible for naming and classification, has created about seven orders, which comprise about 104 families and 505 different genus or genera of viruses. So there are a really large amount of viruses that are already characterized and studied. When we write viral names, there's a couple key things. Families, so the viral families, are always italicized and they end with the suffix viridae. So for instance, if we talk about the hepadna viridae, the hepadna viridae include all of the hepatitis viruses, hepatitis A, B, C, and D. Genera, on the other hand, the genus, are also italicized, and they just end with the word virus. Okay, so that would be something like the pox virus or the coronavirus. They're italicized, but that describes the actual genus of the virus. Viruses are named um, in a particular way. And viral types that share a collection of properties, such as the host range that they infect, the way that they infect a host, or what we call their pathogenicity, and their genetic makeup, classify them together as a species. So they have similar properties uh, that put them into basically the same group. The way that we place a virus into a family include the type of captain. So is it helical? Is it icosahedral? Their nucleic acid strand number, whether they have an envelope or not. Their host cell range, which determines the type of host cell in which the virus is able to enter and multiply. And also we are able to detail what they look like under the electron microscope. The common species name of a virus frequently is based on the disease that the virus causes. So when they assign, those taxonomists assign uh, a species name to a virus, it's often based on the disease that it causes. So I like this table 6-2 in your text gives you not only the nucleic acid type, specifically some of the DNA viruses and some of the RNA viruses that we're gonna talk about, but it also gives you the several of the viruses and the diseases that they are responsible for causing. And we will talk about the majority, almost all of these this semester uh, later on in the course. This is usually during the uh, fourth exam uh, we get into the viruses. So now we're gonna get into a really important part, and we're gonna to start to talk about the viral multiplication cycle. You can think of this almost as the life cycle of a virus. We don't call it a life cycle because they are non-living agents, um, so we call it a multiplication cycle. And there's several parts to this. First of all, the first step is what we call the adsorption step. 
And this is really where the virus binds to specific molecules on the host cell. The receptors, when we talk about an animal virus, the receptors to which an animal virus attaches, those attachment molecules are actually what we call glycoproteins. So it's a sugar protein uh, combination for that particular molecule. So once the virus adsorbs or attaches, it then penetrates. And penetration involves the genome, the nucleic acid, either the DNA or the RNA, entering into the host cell. From there, some viruses, specifically the animal viruses, go through an uncoding phase. And this is where the capsid is actually broken off from the nucleic acid. Again, and the nucleic acid needs to get out to be able to take over the internal functions of that host cell. And once the nucleic acid takes over the host cell, the viral multiplication process then enters into the synthesis stage. And this is where the virus in, uh, informs the host cell to make all of the new viral components, the new capsids, the new nucleic acids. And once all those components are made, we go into assembly where the new viral particles are then constructed. And lastly, Viruses, again, since these are pathogens, not parasites, they want to get into a host cell, they want to do their damage, and they want to get out. So we go through a process called release, where those newly assembled viruses either break out of the cell through a process called lysis, where they basically break through the cell, or they can be released as uh, little pieces from the membrane uh, through a process which we call exocytosis, exo meaning exit from the cell, or exocytosis is also called budding. So let's talk about the animal viruses specifically first. So right now we are only looking at the animal viruses. So here is my eukaryotic cell, as you can tell, because it has a nucleus here. You'll notice these little receptors on the membrane of the host cell. And here's my virus. Again, since it's an animal virus, it's enveloped. So it has this additional layer on the outside with the spikes. Really important to understand when we talk about the host range. The host range of a virus is limited by these host cell receptors on the cell membrane. So think of it as a lock and key. If these receptors on the host cell membrane don't match the spikes on the virus, then this virus is not gonna be able to enter that host cell type. So that's why when we talk about something like the recently occurring coronavirus, it impacts the respiratory cells um, because the spikes attach to specific receptors on the host cell membrane of your respiratory cells. So we mentioned step one, this adsorption step, this is where the spikes come in and the virus binds to the receptors on the host cell. The penetration step number two, you'll notice now that this viral particle starts to push its way in or create this little in indination into the host cell membrane. And basically as this pushes in, eventually this is going to pop off and this membrane is then gonna surround this viral particle. So it's gonna basically pinch off this piece of membrane, and that piece of membrane is going to surround this uh, viral particle. Once the virus is into the cell, we need to get this nucleic acid out. So we need to take off all this external stuff on the outside. So we go through a process called uncoating, where we actually break off the capsid and we get this piece of nucleic acid out. This nucleic acid is then going to host or tell the host cell to start to create or synthesize its new viral um, nucleic acid and also the new capsid. So it's going to create all those new capsomer units that are going to come together and form the new capsid. We're going to form the new spikes for attachment. And we're going to replicate 
all of that uh, RNA or nucleic acid. And eventually, they're, we're now going to have to go through assembly where we take these three things and put them together to form the new virus. Once the new virus is formed, we mentioned it needs to get out. And we remember we saw that when the virus comes in, it kind of pushes into the host cell or creates this little uh, push, this little wedge here. It's going to do the same thing when it goes out. So it's going to start to push this piece of membrane outwards. And you'll notice right now it's a naked or non enveloped virus. But eventually it's going to push, 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 push. And this piece of membrane is going to break off and surround this capsid. So this is the animal virus uh, multiplication cycle. So we have the adsorption, the attachment, the penetration, where the virus pushes into the cell. This is called, sometimes known as endocytosis. You can think of N-E-N -E -N as enter. So endocytosis is where this goes in. We have the uncoating, take off the envelope and the capsid to get your nucleic acid free. The nucleic acid is then gonna tell the host cell to replicate or create all of the new viral parts. We're going to assemble them together and we're gonna push this new viral particle out and surround it again in the release or exocytosis in a piece of host cell membrane. So we've already kind of talked about the adsorption and the host range. And we said that in order for a virus to get into a host cell, it's limited by the receptors on the host cell's cell membrane. So those two things have to match together. So we call that the host range. So for instance, hepatitis B is only gonna be able to impact human liver cells. Polio virus is going to target target the intestinal and nerve cells, and rabies can go after a range of cells in many mammals, including muscular cells and nervous system cells as well. We talked about the penetration or uncoating, and we said that in this particular process, we called this uh, endocytosis, or it's also sometimes known as fusion where this viral envelope fuses directly with the host cell membrane. And as it pushes itself in, that endocytosis, that viral particle is engulfed and is surrounded by a piece of that um, host cell membrane that needs to then be uncoated so we can release the nucleic acid. This is just another way of being able to look at the endocytosis and the exocytosis. Again, the top series here, this is endo or entering. The bottom series is our exo. So we have our virus again. So here's our attachment. The spikes attach to the receptors. They start to push inwards. And as they push inwards, they are then going to uh, generate and get that piece of the virus into the host cell membrane. We're then going to have to uncoat the uh, capsid and get our piece of RNA out to be able to go through the rest of the process. And again, this is just showing some different forms of that viral penetration. We've already mentioned synthesis. And we already said that uh, synthesis is where we're going to take and create uh, the new DNA or of RNA um, through the process of replication. And then we're going to assemble that all together. You do not need to worry about positive sense or negative sense RNA. I will not ask you anything about that. And then assembly, again, is just putting everything together taking all those viral components, making sure that the nucleic acid's in the core and the capsid is completely formed with the uh, spikes embedded within the... Uh... And then we have release. And release, we said, is kind of the opposite as the uh, adsorption and penetration. 
This is known as budding or exocytosis when we talk about an enveloped virus. And that's where that uh, capsid basically binds to the membrane and eventually pinches off and is surrounded by a piece of the host cell membrane. We're going to see in a few moments when we talk about the non-enveloped or the bacteriophages, they go through a process called lysis, where they actually cause the host cell to rupture and release all of the new viral particles. So again, here is an example of our maturation and release of the viral particles. So here's our uh, RNA here, surrounded by our different pieces of capsid. You'll then see that the capsid has surrounded and has the nucleic acid in the core. And then this is gonna start to push on the host cell membrane, eventually being surrounded by that uh, host cell membrane, which is then gonna pinch off and form our new enveloped viral particle, which is then free to go on and infect the new cell. So what type of damage does a virus do to a host cell? Well, we have what's known as the cytopathic effects. And this is a virus-induced damage that is done to the host cell. And it's often able to be seen using the light microscope. So you're able to see this damage to the host cells under examination by the light microscope. And this could be disorientation of cells. This could be changes in the size or shape of a cell. It could also be intracellular changes, such as these uh, little bodies that form called inclusion bodies, or they may actually cause multiple cells to fuse together and form these giant cells we call syncytium. So here is, this is table 6.3 from your book. This walks through some of the cytopathic changes in uh, many of the human viruses. So you can see things like smallpox causes cells to round up with those inclusions in the cytoplasm. Uh, we talk about herpes virus causes those giant multinucleated cells, which we call syncytium. Uh, the measles virus, again, also causes those multinucleated giant syncytial cells to form. And many viruses can also cause what's known as persistent infections. So we talk about acute infections, which usually have a very rapid onset, something like a cold, and they go away relatively quickly. Persistent infections last for extremely long durations. And this is because the cell actually harbors the virus and is not immediately broken open. So it's not gonna break the cell and in the process of lysis and release the viral particles out. So persistent infections can last for weeks or even lifetime. And there's often points where the virus can come out of its hiding, which we call reactivation. And this is what we know as the chronic or latent state. So latency is where the virus can remain dormant and then eventually reactivate. So some examples here, we have things like the measles virus, which can remain hidden in your brain cells. Herpes simplex virus, things like cold sores and genital herpes, you, uh, you'll often hear if you watch some of the commercials for many of the medications that are out there. They'll talk about flare-ups. These flare-ups are this latent state where the virus remains dormant in the body and can be reactivated. Same thing with herpes zoster virus. We talk a lot about the varicella virus, which causes chicken pox as a kid. And then the chickenpox virus actually remains dormant in your nerve ganglia and can eventually reemerge or reactivate later in adulthood, causing a condition on the skin known as shingles. Viruses can also do more additional damage, especially when we're talking about with genetic material. Viruses have the ability to permanently alter a host cell's genetic material thus causing cancers. So viruses are often termed oncogenic, and that means that they are able to permanently 
alter the genetic makeup and result in cancer. So we know that as transformation. So we're causing them to go from normally growing cells to um, out of control cancer cells that have these increased rates of growth, changes to the chromosomes, and they can divide indefinitely for significant periods of time, causing tumors or masses of cell growth to form. These can include things like the papillomaviruses, HPV. Uh, HPV can cause cervical cancer. There's a particular strain known as HPV-16. Um, many children today around the age of 13 actually receive the HPV vaccination, and that is intended to protect them from um, you know, this particular virus, which can cause this transformation to their normally growing cells. There's also Epstein-Barr virus, which is typically known for causing infectious mononucleosis. However, in some cases, it can actually cause the production of this um, massive tumor in the neck and jaw region known as Burkitt's lymphoma. So I wanna transition. We've spent some time talking about the multiplication cycle in animal viruses. I wanna get in and talk about the multiplication cycle of our bacteriophages or our viruses that infect bacteria. The most widely studied ones that we know of are the ones that infect E. coli. E. coli is really one of the big study organisms, the representative organisms that we use to study the effects of microorganisms. Um, multiplication follows a similar process as in animal viruses. One of the big differences is there's no uncoding step because we're going to see with complex viruses, only the genetic material gets pushed into the cell. So there's no need to take off the capsid in that uncoding step. Release is also different as well because there is no uh, exocytosis or budding. It is literally just, it breaks open the cell in the process of lysis. So we're gonna call this the lytic cycle. And the lytic cycle means that it ends with host cell lysis. So again, we do see the absorption where the virus binds to molecules on the host cell. Our penetration now we mentioned is a little bit different. Instead of the whole virus entering in or pushing in through that fusion or endocytosis, now the virus injects its genetic material directly into the host cell. Again, it's also going to go through replication. So the viral components are going to cause synthesis to occur. Assembly is going to happen where the new viral particles are assembled. It's going to mature or finish forming those viral particles. And then it's going to end in the release, which is that lysis or breaking open of the host cells to release the new viral particles. And as a rule of thumb, for every one virus that enters a host cell and goes through replication, approximately 100 new viral particles are going to emerge to go on and infect additional host cells. You'll notice at the bottom of the slide, occasionally the virus is able to enter into a state known as lysogeny. We call this the lysogenic cycle. And that basically means that right here after penetration, so at step two, once that nucleic acid enters the host cell, it can actually incorporate into the host cell's genetic material. So that nucleic acid, that DNA, is able to basically insert itself right into the host chromosome and go dormant for some period of time. It is reversible. Okay? So you'll notice here the, the statement of reversible. So at any point, if the host cell goes under a degree of stress, this virus can come out of lysogeny, so that genetic material can come out of the host chromosome, and we can finish the process. We can go through replication, assembly, and eventually break it open and get out. So this basically walks through again. Here is our complex virus here, our bacteriophage. 
as I mentioned, the nucleic acid is usually up here in the core of the capsid. The body of this virus is going to contract using these uh, spikes here to punch holes, and it's going to act almost like a syringe and inject its nucleic acid right into the bacterial cell. Once this nucleic acid is in, again, you're seeing right here, here's the little bacteriophage on the outside. This capsid stays on the outside. Here is the genetic material, which is now gone in through penetration. It is now going through and causing that replication to occur, making all of the new parts. We're starting to assemble the new parts together into these mature viral particles. And eventually it's going to punch a hole in that cell membrane and all these new viral particles are going to be released. So there are some similarities between the lytic cycle and the animal viral life cycles, but there are some key differences. And this is just an electron micrograph showing this bacterial host cell here with that lysis and all of these new viral particles emerging. But you can also see all of the original uh, viral capsules that had attached to the outside of that host cell membrane. Again, I like this. This is a really beneficial table. This is table 6-4 from your text. This is great as you sit down and start to study and compare the differences. Uh, it gives you the descriptions between the bacteriophage or lytic cycle and the animal viral life cycle and the key similarities and differences between each phase of the multiplication cycle. We also, we've talked about lysogeny a little bit, and we said that with the bacteriophage, sometimes they undergo adsorption and penetration, but they don't replicate. And that viral DNA basically inserts itself into the bacterial chromosome, which we call a prophage. And so the cell does not get laced at this point. And that prophage, can actually stay and remain dormant like that for an extremely long period of time. However, at some point, if the host cell undergoes stress, we go through a process known as induction, where the viral uh, DNA comes out of the host chromosome and it finishes off the steps of the lytic cycle, causing the host cell to lyse and releases all of those new viral particles. So as we transition, we also want to talk about how we study and cultivate or grow animal viruses. And there are three primary goals to growing viruses. The first one is it's to isolate and identify viruses from specimens that we've collected in the hospital or lab setting, to get viruses ready for vaccination production, or for detailed research to document the patterns, the cycles, and the genetics of viral particles uh, and their effects on the host cells. There are two ways that we can cultivate um, microorganisms. We have what we call in vitro, which means in living tissue or culture. And we also have in vivo, which means uh, within an actual living thing. So in vitro, these cell tissue cultures, in order to have an in vitro growth, we basically have a tissue line that we inject the virus into, and these cultured cells allow the viral replication to occur, and we can observe those cytopathic effects, those damages that are viral-induced on the host cell. We can also use things like bird embryos, which are intact, and animal inoculation. So we can actually inject the virus right into an animal and study its effect on the uh, organ systems. So here's an example here where it's injected into the uh, amniotic sac of the egg. 
One of the things that I do want to emphasize is you are not going to ever be able to study a virus in a test tube or on a Petri dish. They require in a living host cell uh, structure to be able to continue to grow and study them. Viruses are medically important. They are the most common cause of acute infections, such as colds, the common cold. We have several billion viral infections each year, usually ranging with the flu and the common cold. They can have extremely high mortality rates. So um, that's why it's really important for vaccinations to occur for a lot of these. And there are lots of possible connections of viruses to chronic afflictions that we really don't know much about. At one point, they actually thought that multiple sclerosis had some viral connections to it. In order for us to really be able to prevent uh, long-term effects from viral infection, it's really important to do some early detection and treatment. And this can be more difficult than things like bacteria. Um, it really requires healthcare providers to take samples and think about the big picture. So screening for parts of the virus under the microscope, looking at the immune response to a virus, do they generate antibodies? And antiviral drugs do have the ability to cause some side effects. So um, it's really a continuing study in science when we talk about viruses. So we're going to transition out of the viruses, and we're going to end our talk on Chapter 6 with the last two other non-living agents, the prions and the viroids. Prions are infectious proteins. They are these misfolded proteins, and they do not contain nucleic acid. So out of all the infectious agents we're going to talk about in microbiology this semester, this is one of the only ones that does not have nucleic acid, no DNA or RNA. And this is one of the most resistant forms of microbial life. They are resistant to just about all sterilization techniques. And they cause these things known as TSEs, or transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. That's a lot. That's a big word to take in. So let's break it down together. Transmissible means they can be passed on from uh, a reservoir. Spongiform means that they cause a spongy appearance to, to happen. And encephalopathy means a degenerative disease of the nervous system. So these uh, infectious proteins actually cause uh, holes to be punched in your brain tissue, giving your brain the spongy appearance. And there are several different forms. In sheep and goats, we refer to it as scrapie. In cows, we call this BSE, or bovine spongiform encephalopathies, and we know this is mad cow disease. We had our last big uh, pattern with this back in the late 90s from the UK. Uh, the farmers out there were actually, as a way to save uh, costs, were taking the carcasses of dead animals, dead cattle, grinding them up and using that as feed to the cattle. And this disease was actually getting passed through the ground beef uh, supply. And for a while, the U.S. actually cut off all imports of ground beef to protect citizens from contracting the disease. In elk, it's known as wasting disease. And in humans, we call it Kreutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome, or CJS. It used to be called CJD. They've changed that over the years. So again, this prion disease works in a very particular way. The prions get in, they infect a nerve cell, and once they're in, they find these normal proteins that are in the brain tissue. And what they do is they actually cause a configuration change. They cause the normal proteins to convert to abnormal form. And when this happens, they actually cause holes to be punched in that brain tissue. So it's a transformation or change from a normal form to an abnormal form for those proteins. 
We also have, I'm going to skip down to the bottom bullet point for a second. We also have the viroids. And the viroids are these short pieces of RNA. They're infectious RNA. And they target only plants. So these short pieces of RNA, specifically single-stranded RNA, do not contain any protein coat. So that's how they differ from viruses. And they're going to target plants. And then lastly, we have the satellite viruses. And the satellite viruses are dependent on other viruses for their replication to occur. So we have two key members of the satellite virus family. We have the adeno-associated virus, and these replicate only in cells that are infected with the adenovirus. A lot of time causes the common cold. And we have the delta agent, which is this naked strand of single-stranded RNA that is only expressed in the presence of hepatitis B virus. So these satellite viruses are dependent on other viruses for their replication to occur. Important to know those examples. And these are just some other common members of that non-living family. So with that said, I look forward to seeing folks in office hours this week. Uh, feel free to email me any questions you have. Um, I'm looking forward to kind of reading your, your responses on the discussion board to this. And don't be afraid to reach out. I look forward to seeing you all soon. I hope everyone's doing well. Take care.